We got told to evacuate fairly early on um, the Saturday. We got told it was going to hit 96 metres or 97 metres, like it was going to exceed the 93 floods. Effectively, we shut immediately. We found out on, I think it was a Friday, that there will start to be a threat of um, a rising water right behind us and being where the bakery is with the Compassity River right behind it. We are the most vulnerable position in High Street, one of the most vulnerable positions in Echuca. Early October, when we knew dams were filling up and they were overspilling, especially Dartmouth, we knew that this was going to be a bigger flood than a, a normal minor flood. From then, we started preparing. We, we didn't see any of the previous floods, so um, personally. So we didn't know what to expect. We had seen Rachi, so it terrified us. The first weekend that the Compassby River started rising, we were seeing logs, couches, any random object just going down the river so fast and it was all just moving and rising so quickly. Uh, it was very, it's just so unknown that the threat that was going to be posing to us and could still will be coming as well. We got different stories about it was going to wipe out the main street or it was going to at least come up to McDonald's or, um, you know, it was going to wipe out thousands of homes. Um, yeah, we were, we were nervous. We were really nervous. We were definitely preparing for the absolute worst. So without our levee walls in place, we would have well and truly gone under. So we built all our levee walls to a 96 metre height to be comfortable and sure that they would hold and that we wouldn't flood, but stress levels were very high. Everyone flicked into gear over that weekend and thinking it's gonna peak on Wednesday. And so the, the amount of push that everybody had to try and get everybody ready, yeah, d definitely better to be overprepared than underprepared. In the first week, yes, we were overprepared, but I would have rather move a thousand sandbags than have to empty this bar because it was wet. We could see the writing on the wall and we'd been in contact with SES about a month out from the floods actually coming to town. At that point, we engaged a lot of resources at our sand pits to actually have the sand ready and available to, to load out. Knowing that if the call did come and it had to happen, we really wanted to be prepared. We knew that how much at risk we would be, especially as soon as we heard that this levee was being built in front of our house. And we're obviously a ground-based dwelling, we're not on stilts or raised. So we kind of got ourselves as organised as possible and then we thought, well, it's like watching paint dry. We can't just wait for the water to just come. So we'll go and help the other people that maybe weren't as prepared or that needed to get more prepared. And I think that sense of community spirit was so inspiring and that was what like got you out of bed every day to know you're keeping the whole community safe, not just yourself. I cried a lot. Um, I think it was just really overwhelming. I could tell you so many stories and I will cry if I do. When we first started building our wall, we just had some friends and family come in and help. We actually had a stranger come through. He pulled up in a big truck and said, I can go pick up a pallet or two for you. And then when the compass surged and that pushed the Murray right up, we were like, we need more help. So I put a call out on Facebook. We had a phenomenal amount of people from the community come in and help. So a lot of people, I don't know who they were or their names. Without everyone's help, we would have well and truly gone under. So all of our neighbours in the sand pit area, every sand pit was flat out and every business in town that had access to trucks, equipment and people was doing exactly the same thing that we were doing. So by no means were we the only people. You know, I think at one stage in our yard in town, there was 30 trucks went through within a one hour period and, and only eight of those were our trucks. So every truck within probably 200 kilometres was here in town working, galvanising and pulling together for a common theme naturally. Um, it was actually inspiring to see. Uh, once we had everything out, then it was time to get sandbagged and wrapped, but we didn't know what was going to happen or where we were going to get help from, but we put out a post on the community page for support and within 10 minutes we had 10 to 20 people coming down. Within an hour we had about 100 people down at the bakery. It was just absolutely unbelievable. We just couldn't believe how much the community came together, um, not only for us, but for all of the businesses and 
families and around and protecting houses as well. The community has just absolutely come together in an absolutely remarkable way. We had, I think, two rows of sandbags on Friday or Saturday, and then by Sunday we'd had about 10 loads of sandbags come in and just stacked up and stacked up and stacked up. And, and then because we had done it in such a hurry, there was little spots that were leaking and so we had to man pumps. So the first, I think, three or four nights, we actually slept here to man the pumps. So we had some, yeah, really, really good employees that came in to check on us, even a couple that don't work for us anymore came in, check in, what can we do? One of them bought food for us when they heard that we were staying the night to do the pumps. The way that people unquestionably just dedicated their time and efforts into doing things like sandbagging and people just preparing and providing meals for those who wanted to work 24 seven, giving up their day jobs just to go out and be part of a great community. We received an email from an ex Echuca community member and she wanted to um, donate $500 worth of coffees to any of the volunteers who had been sandbagging, um, helping out, out of work. So we put that out to the community and that took off. And we did a little media push with Sunrise on Channel 7 and they announced it to Australia and the phones kept ringing and before we knew it we had $10,000 worth of donations um, for people to come in, get a coffee on their way, whether they were CFA, SES, police, volunteers, just someone out of work, anything. So for a good week and a half, no one was buying coffees. They were all just getting f free drinks whenever they came in and everyone was just blown away. So there was a lot of people in the sandbagging area that needed to be fed, they were working very hard down there so our catering team decided that uh, they'd come back to the club and cook up uh, a heap of meals to take down to them. Oh, we were closed but we still went in and made food. We gave a lot of sushi to Myanmar where the sandbags are and in Ichuka. And the third day we made some suvlagis so we took that again to volunteers and I was very proud of what the community did, so the least I can do is give them a feed, give them some energy. Courtney from the local McDonald's store noticed that we were doing that and given that they'd been closed for some time, she contacted the club and we had a little collaboration between um, us and McDonald's, so Courtney and Scott Moller were fantastic, supplied us with some patties and chicken nuggets and um, some fries as uh, they call them. Our catering team cooked them up and took them down to the volunteers at the sandbagging area. I know at Moama where they were filling the bags, they also had a child mining service there so people volunteering to look after kids and the adults could do the sandbags. So the army came in on the first day and laid the foundation and then the next day the SES and the fireys. After that uh, army came back because they were really concerned about the, how quickly the water was rising. Building it up, building it up, making sure the wall was going to hold, it was strong enough and it was high enough to, to protect everything. EMM Group uh, predominantly was involved with the sandbagging, or supplying of the sandbagging. Chuka Moama, back to Rochester initially, and then Shepherd and Bumbatha, Kerrang a little bit, and also Midiamo and, and Dingy. We didn't sandbag until two or three days later. We put the call out and we had about 40 people in here in about I think 15 minutes. So the bar got very well protected very quickly because I think everyone likes to protect the cocktails. <laughs> you could tell the people coming in in the afternoon or um, in their workout gear covered head to toe in sand, or the kids, or they've got the sunburn because you know they've been out <laughs> digging sand all afternoon. When I got here at about 11 o'clock, there was probably about 200 people and they were started at the Beechworth Bakery and started making their way all the way to Monkey and Co. It was incredible, like the conga lines that they had going with the sandbags was just really, really impressive. Our library took two hours and that was a big area and to have so many people bag them and stack them in two hours, it was, it was crazy to see that happen. We were down bagging Channa Street when there was a bloke by himself with a trailer load of sandbags and the whole CFA jumped in. They rebuilt the wall around his house and I think every day of the flood, someone that we knew was going back to check on this guy to bring him more sandbags. We got him a pump, like you do the call out and people were there. 
But I saw people 60, 70 year old to 15 year old, even younger, and they were doing jobs they probably shouldn't be doing. Some of the young girls are lifting 20 kilo bags. The nine days we did into Echuca Moama, it was nine days, it was 9,000 tonne, and it was a lot of fuel, it was a lot of kilometres, and it was a lot of resources. But absolutely the same process that we were doing was happening across every company in town that had access to sand, was supplying it everywhere at the time that they possibly could. A couple of guys in charge who knew what they were doing, and they just took the bull by the horns, and yeah, just everyone just followed in suit. It was, yeah, it was pretty impressive to see. So it was a big nine days, the drivers were worn out, the trucks were worn out, they were dirty and dusty, but the, the key thing for us at the time was just to get the sand out there. People just did it with no questions asked. The feeling was amazing to see the community. It didn't matter what age. If it was only 10 bags or 1,000 bags, it didn't matter. You did what you're capable of doing, and that's very important that everybody can do only what they can. I know a lot of the staff were out sandbagging, protecting their houses. A few were on the other side in Ogilvy, um, so they were kind of protecting their parents or their grandparents or, you know, everyone from this bar was out and about in this community doing something and I ran into, I think, every single one of them, which was really nice to see. The amount of people turning up with sandbags, even uh, like guys driving around with sandbags in the back of their utes or in trailers, pulling up in front of places asking people, do they need sandbags, like off their own back was fantastic and then the amount of people turning up just to lay sandbags out the front of shops it was yeah very unprecedented and it was pretty amazing to see so I think within an hour most shops around here had all their front doors sandbagged. Once that levee bank was done and set up properly biggest threat for us after that point was the stormwater drains so our car park is one of the lowest points of High Street so I was collecting the stormwater from the street so we have had Fire Rescue Victoria down pumping out water out of the drains every hour on the hour for a week and a half now but this is actually going to be in place for at least the next few weeks potentially months uh, depending on how the rain upholds and how it all comes down the river it's touching to know that there was people out there that you haven't seen for ages that still care I mean, like especially High Street, where like we obviously all have businesses and food and that kind of thing, and so we had people from every like so yeah, Nico, Nico, obviously Tomo, with, uh, Monkey and Co, us, these guys next door, Arbury, um, Nick and Maria, like everyone chipped in. Unfortunately, after like a, a natural disaster, you do actually see just the greatness in having a you know being part of a regional town. The amount of people that like came together and like. Yeah, just businesses that are closed up. Now nah, the priority at the moment is just getting everybody ready to go. Between the four of us here, you know, Jenny was traffic controlling, the boys were digging sandbags. They were lifting them, we were loading them, we were delivering them. We were turning up at houses where we didn't know anyone and just helping them bag their houses because they couldn't lift a sandbag. We, yeah, we did everything, everything that we could do because, you know, it was the only thing we could do. It was a massive community effort. We all chipped in and did what we did to save the town, and we did. So we were very fortunate we had time to do it and compared to other towns that didn't have a chance, it was very special for the community, what they did. I'm very proud to be in Machuca. A lot of that sense of togetherness, not too many tears yet. Um, we, did have, we did see a few of those as well, um, a few people who had really had nowhere else to go. an ideal scenario as you can see we found ourselves on the wrong side of the levee as people say but really in this community there was no side it was our neighbours on this side were helping just as much as the people on our side so yeah our house was pretty severely impacted by the floods but it is what it is everywhere else is dry and we're happy to be the um the sacrificial lamb i suppose yeah something like something that something like that yeah. <laughs> The 
Relief Centre provided support for people who were flood affected, so somewhere to sleep, somewhere to eat and all the different supports that they needed at that time. There was up to 80 people staying there overnight and down to as low as half a dozen. The majority of those people definitely had nowhere else to sleep, that's what they were there for, that was their home. Everything in the shop can be replaced for us. Uh, but there's obviously people who have lost their houses. We're very fortunate that it all could be replaced. That's just the main takeaway I had, like control what you can, let go of what you can't. There's worse things out there than what we went through. We do have a lot of friends in Rochester and that was, that was crazy what happened down there. They didn't get a chance and the stories you hear that uh, the water wouldn't take the corners of the bank and just go straight over and I went for a drive because I got some good friends down there and it was very sad to see couch, fridge, carpet, everything on the footpath and trucks lined up to take it to the tip, you know, that was, that's sad. It's still all the way around the house. We've still got two pumps running like around the clock to keep it out from under the house. But um, yeah, there's still, there's not much more we can do really. It's No, yeah, now it's just the it waiting is. game, yeah. yeah. To work extremely hard in your every day and then come home and be fighting a different battle at night time. It's, it's definitely taken a toll, just like on everyone's mental capacity, I think a bit. Yeah, emotionally you do kind of feel a little bit segregated from everybody else. Physically, it's exhausting. Emotionally, it's exhausting. As a mental health nurse, I was able to provide support for people who found themselves in that situation, living in the relief centre. Uh, helping them move towards their next temporary accommodation. Financially it's a huge strain on us following the last couple of years of COVID as well. Having to do a lot of refunds, cancellations, just puts a whole other stress on it. Plus the cost of having to build all our walls, all that cost adds up as well. Our season would normally have already started. We're sort of on hold really to work out what's going to happen with the quality of the water when we'll be able to get access, that it's going to be safe for our returning customers. So yeah, just sort of wait and see really. As far as an after effect of these floods, town, town's hurting, town's quiet. Um, we, we're noticing the tourists not here uh, we, and we're really, we're really missing them, myself included. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a strong little local following but we're really noticing it doesn't feel like that summer trade that we would normally have in late November, early December. Our Twin Towns is very resilient. Everyone put their best foot forward and we try and move on as best and as quickly as we can to recover and to bring our tourism back to our Twin Towns. So I have no, no doubt at all that once the river recedes well and truly enough and parks can clean up that everyone will bounce back. We were here for about four or five days in a row, sandbagging along and doing whatever we could do to help out because everyone had been so great to us. So you just, yeah, be a part of that community and, try and yeah, pay back the love that you got. You do know you've got that support there, like the amount of reach out that we've had from, you know, people that we haven't even met or, you know, spoken to that live like a few doors down or uh, businesses that, like customers that, you know, we didn't think that we um, had much of a relationship with and um, they've reached out or, you know, given us food or, you know, all sorts of stuff. It's been incredible, like absolutely incredible. Not many towns do get opportunity to save the town and we did and we did it well, so you know it's uh, it's amazing to everybody involved. It doesn't matter from a 10-year-old kid to an 80-year-old person; they all jumped in in their own way. They helped. Everyone was doing everything selflessly. They were just helping this town because they wanted to. There's no amount of words for the people that have come into our business, for the people that have come into our house, the people that have even just stood over here and delivered stuff. Like, you know, it makes me so proud to live here. It really does. I'm just blown away with the amount of people that have just levelled up and 
yeah, just got amongst it. Chukamoama is an amazing community. Under stress, everyone rose. There was no one that didn't put their hand up. But we definitely need for our tourists to come and support us like they always have. There's lots to see and do here and come and experience this amazing community. Don't yeah. forget though, we got to clean up all this shit first. Yeah, come back. Before we yeah. can have a celebration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>。everyone who volunteered and helped us through this crisis of the high water level, I'd just like to say thank you, especially for the kids who have given up their basketball and given up that whole facility for people to live in there for the last three weeks. It's been awesome. And just to the whole general community, everyone pulled together, done a great job, and it just shows what a resilient community we are, and we will get through this. To the people of Echuca and Moama, on behalf of the Black Pudding family, we really appreciate the amount of time and effort that everyone put in. To everyone that helped in any way possible, we thank you. On behalf of myself and Beechworth Bakery, we just want to extend a huge thank you to Echuca Moana community, the SES, the RFV and everyone else who has come and helped us through these really unknown times. On behalf of the team here at Moama RSL, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the community for everything that you've done. From all of us at Johnny and Lyle, just a sincere thank you to everyone who supported us through such a tough time and um, we're so proud to be part of this community. From Narish and Oppa and the team, we would like to thank Echuca and all the volunteers that came to Echuca uh, to support the town and uh, make it safe. I just want to give a big shout out to our local community and everybody um, that helped during um, the getting, I guess, prepared for sandbagging and whatever else they had to do. Um, it was absolutely amazing. On behalf of everyone at EMM Group, we'd just like to thank the community and congratulate them on the way that they really galvanised together at a really, really difficult time in our history. Uh, well done and keep up the good work. On behalf of myself and our team here at Bali, whether you lifted one sandbag or a thousand, we thank you. From one side of the levee to the other, we thank you Ichuka Moama. Thank you.